Hey listeners, welcome back to another new story with Revolving Time. Infidelity is a deeply painful and complex issue that can shatter the very foundation of trust in a relationship. When you discover that your spouse has been cheating, the emotional turmoil can be overwhelming. It's a hard experience that leaves you questioning not only your partner's loyalty, but also your own self-worth. Today's story is about, I suspected and caught my wife cheating. I found her profile on of the largest dating sites. I wouldn't have believed it was true if I hadn't seen everything for myself. Well my friends, go to the story and look what happened in there. There are some days that should never happen. Today was one of these days. Actually, to tell the truth, the last several hundred should have never happened. Life used to be good, fun, and exciting. There were things to look forward to every day. I used to get up in the morning and be excited about going to work. If I got a new project I would be excited with the challenge. I would look forward to getting home from work so I could spend time with my stunning bride. The weekends were a time of sheer bliss, walks in the park, picnics, camping, hiking, and passionate lovemaking. That all stopped some time ago. The sad thing is I am not even sure when the good times went bad. Maybe it was the vacation in Cozumel. The night I woke up to use the restroom and discovered my wife was not in bed. I went down to the pool area to try to find her, thinking that maybe she couldn't sleep and had gone to relax and read by the pool. What I found was a long line of guys waiting to get into the women's shower. At the front of the line, there she was, pulling a train. I always knew she was a slot, but this was a little over the top. Perhaps it was that night she went out with her girlfriends, who knew she would get a headache and come home early to find me buried balls deep in sweet little Cindy, our next-door neighbor's 18-year-old daughter. Update, I'm sure you are wondering, why the HL are we still together? Well, marriage counseling can be a wonderful thing. We had an excellent therapist and worked through each of these incidents, and others, amicably. We talked them out and agreed we had both been in the wrong in each instance and had made amends. Life was great for a while after the counseling seemingly back to the way it was when we were first married. Little did I know she had learned how to hide her activities better and not stop them like she assured me she did. This morning, I was searching for a tie and found an envelope full of pictures from our wedding day on the top shelf of the closet. I thought they were all in the album but could understand right away why these weren't. There she was in her wedding gown. Something blue, something new, something borrowed, something like that anyway. The something that got my attention was my best man's dot buried deep in my beautiful bride's mouth. Seeing the pastor really was not a shock knowing what I knew about her. Wait, you're saying, things have been going well since the counseling and this was a long time ago. Read on my dear friends. I would have called in dead this morning, but I had a very important presentation to give to the executive team. I had been working on this deal for well over a year, virtually on my own, and had finally come to an agreement with the client for representation. This deal would guarantee my position in the company for the rest of my life if I so chose. It seems that bringing a few hundred million dollars into the company coffers has that effect. I had my presentation ready to go, and good one if I say so myself. Screw PowerPoint. I had gone straight to video. DVD to be exact, with paid actors laying out the proposition step by step, stressing the positive financial aspect of course. I had paid dearly for professional graphics and a killer soundtrack to boot. Well, I should have known it was all for naught. My biggest problem at work was in his whole named Brad. No matter what I did, he would try to one-up me. If possible, he would steal my ideas as his own. Given half a chance, he would badmouth me to the executive team daily. Oh, did I mention he is the father of that 18-year-old neighbor girl? The counseling didn't seem to have much effect on him for some reason, go figure. Something about knowing that I popped his sweet little daughter's cherry seems to have left him with a bad taste in his mouth when it came to me. I can't imagine why. There I was, ready to queue up my presentation when Brad walked into the conference room. I should have picked up the nearest heavy object and caved his worthless skull in when I saw the smirk on his face. I was still thinking a bit slow with what I had already faced that morning and didn't get the chance. It seems that Bish Boy had done some research on this new client I had been busting my ass to sign up. He gleefully laid it out on the table for all to see. There was nothing here I hadn't seen before, but some of it had information I really didn't want the executive team seeing. In our business, the first impression given by a company is everything. It does not matter what the truth is. If someone will believe a line of Bulls HT then that becomes the new truth. Bradley proceeded to inform the big bosses that my new client would be bad for our business from a moral standpoint. He had discovered that one of the subsidiaries of this multinational giant produced P. Graphy. I already knew this and pointed out that the income generated from this subsidiary accounted for less than 1% of the gross revenue for my client, as well as the fact that the PRN in question was restricted to the European market. As I said, first impressions are God. 
The board consisted of a bunch of guys in their 70s and over who hadn't been laid since Nixon was president. I was very promptly and not so politely informed that they were immensely disappointed with my work and that my services were no longer needed. Did I mention that Brad is in his hole? I had no choice but to go home. I figured I would guzzle a few beers to try to drown my sorrows, maybe watch some TV and just be a complete couch potato for a few days. Maybe Cindy from next door would come home in her cheerleader outfit and ride me while still wearing it. A guy has to have something to look forward to in life. When I pulled into my street, I knew something was fishy. Parked there in front of my house was not one, not two, but three municipal garbage trucks. I pulled over a few houses down and walked slowly to my house wondering what was going on. I quietly worked my way around back, peeking into every window I passed. I found the answer in the game room. There she was in all her glory, with six garbage men. My life just keeps getting better and better. I thought. I snuck away from the window and went quickly back to my car, retrieving my digital camera from the glove box. I made my way back to the game room window and snapped as many pictures of her tryst as I could, some good ones too. I wanted to document this, not for future jack-off material, but for court. I was finally sick of dealing with this, the bish had to go. When the satisfied public workers started getting dressed I made my way back to my car and headed across town to a club I knew was open at this time of morning. The dancers were not the best, but they were not the bottom of the barrel either. The girls were all friendly and didn't have a problem sitting and talking with the customers, even without laying out the bucks for a few table dances. There was none of the I'm so beautiful, worship me attitude that was prevalent at most of the higher class clubs. Some of the girls were exceedingly beautiful, but had not inherited the bishy goddess gene along with their looks. I had not visited the club for quite some time, but it was clear that not much had changed since the last time I was here. The place was clean with only a few customers at this time of the day. There were a few guys scattered around nursing their beers and trying to hide their hardens while ogling the girls. I made my way to the back of the room to the darkest corner. I needed alone time, time to think and make plans to get rid of the worthless bish who called herself my wife. Before I got comfortable a girl was already there asking what I wanted to drink. She temporarily made me forget my bad day in a hurry. She introduced herself as Crystal and was absolutely adorable, about 5 feet 1, long brunette hair with striking blue eyes. Want some company? She asked as she returned with my beer. Maybe in a bit, I'd like to just relax a while. I replied, okay, don't forget about me. She said with a wink and a smile before she walked away. Update 1. I sat there watching some of the girls dance for a while, just relaxing and trying to get my mind to stop going a million miles an hour. After an hour or so, I was much calmer and thinking a little more clearly. The first thing I had to do was deal with the pictures I had taken. I pulled my laptop out of its case, setting it up on the small table in front of me. This place had a lot of business customers, so a laptop wasn't a new sight. I reached in my pocket and removed the memory card from the camera, plugging it into the slot on the side of the laptop. Computers were okay, cameras of course were forbidden. After I downloaded the pictures I went through each one, cropping, fixing color, enhancing, whatever it needed. I was almost done with them when Crystal walked up and plopped down beside me. I didn't see her coming and didn't have a chance to minimize the screen. What are you working on? She asked, as her eyes got wide with surprise. I decided I might as well tell the truth, it might help if I got it off my chest. I told her what I had seen that morning at my house, in explicit detail. I suppose I could have given her a somewhat R-rated version, but I was in the mood to see if I could shock her. To my surprise the expression on her face hardly changed, if anything she began looking serious. So, what are you going to do now? She asked with genuine concern. Well, I replied, I'll probably go home, show her the pictures, and kick her sorry as out. Crystal thought for a minute. I have a better idea. She said with a smirk on her face. How about you go home and act like everything is fine? Don't tell her you lost your job or that you caught her this morning. Do your best to act normal. For the next few days come by here while you would normally be at work. See if you can catch her and get more pictures for proof before doing anything. The more proof you have, the better case you can make. She will get most of what you have and spousal support if you go to court with just these pictures. I used to duck a guy who was a divorce lawyer. He taught me a lot. I had to admit, this sounded like a good idea. I know she'll try to duck me. I said bluntly, I really don't want to get anywhere near her. There's no telling what she caught this morning. Just tell her you aren't feeling well, you have a headache or something. That might work, but only for a day or two. This should only take a few days. If it takes longer you can go out of town on a business trip for a week or so. She said, if she's as much of a skank as you are saying, she'll have something set up pretty much every day, so getting more evidence won't be a problem. 
Okay, I'll see what happens. I'm sure the slot will be busy. I replied, chuckling. She's not a slot, said Crystal with a serious look on her face. I'm a slot. She's a SK and K. Slots are out for a good time, but in a good way. SK and K has stuck people over when they have a good time. There's a big difference. I can't believe you just told me that you're a slot. I laughed. Crystal gave me a cute little grin and said, Oh, but I am. See those two girls. She said as she pointed across the room to the main stage where two of the cutest little things I had ever seen were grinding against each other. That's Brittany and Kayla. They're my roommates. And guess what? They're slots too. You seem like a really nice guy who's getting duckhead in a bad way. I'll go talk to them and see if we can't arrange something to cheer you up, to take your mind off things for a while. She paused then quickly added, if you want to that is. You what? I blurted out, I couldn't believe this. Like I said, if you want to, we'll make you forget all about the SK and K, believe me. Crystal sat there with a very cute, very devious, very sexy grin on face. She was loving the fact that she had shocked me when I had failed to shock her. To say I was dumbfounded would be the understatement of the century. I didn't know what to think. This was an entirely new experience for me, though I couldn't help but to think about what it would be like. If I took her up on her offer, wouldn't I be just like my wife? Wouldn't it be no different? Would this just be stooping to her level? My mind was back to a million miles an hour. Crystal's hand caressing my thigh, and the two nymphs all but doing each other on stage were not helping the matter. Well, asked Crystal, I don't know. I mumbled, it sounds like heaven, but wouldn't it make me just like her? Nope, she ducked you over behind your back, you just got lucky that you found out. Your marriage is over, you're hurting, and your mind won't shut off to give you any peace. You need to relax and learn that you aren't the bad guy. It was her doing, not yours. Let us help you, please, she said, giving me a very sexy look. I have to go dance now, I'll come back when I'm done. She gave me a peck on the cheek and scurried off to the dressing room. Why did she have to wiggle that perfect as when she knew I was looking? DM it. I was left alone with my thoughts, my head swimming. I'd be lying if I said the offer wasn't appealing. What guy in his right mind would turn this down? Three gorgeous young ladies offering their bodies for pleasure. Crystal was a looker, and Brittany and Kayla were perfect too. I still wasn't sure if it would be a good idea. Crystal was announced as next on stage about the same time I saw her coming out of the dressing room. She had changed into an outfit that looked something like a belly dancing costume, if one could be made with only a few square inches of fabric. As she was climbing up onto the stage, her music started. It sounded something like a cross between an ea and Evanescence. The music was melodious and moving, but with a hard driving undertone that was mesmerizing. The music may have been compelling, but Crystal could have awoken every dead pope and given them extremely impure thoughts. My god could that girl move. I had seen some good dancers over the years, but she made them all look like second year ballet students. Her body did things I didn't know were possible. She made everything look so exci I wanted to go up on the stage and take her up on her offer. A bomb going off under my table couldn't have made me take my eyes off her. She didn't dance to the music. She became the music. The music became her. There was no distinction. Every movement, every gesture, every last detail was in perfect harmony. She still had the same sexy little smirk on her face as when she left my table, and the entire time she was on the stage she hardly took her eyes off me. It was as if she was looking straight into my soul and could read my every thought and desire. Her set ended much too quickly. She gave me a little wave and mouth just a minute as she left the stage. That minute felt like an eternity. She returned to the table with the two nymphs in tow, and all of them had devious, sexy little grins. I suddenly felt like a specimen on display. The girls took seats around the table as Crystal introduced me to Brittany and Kayla. We exchanged greetings. Well, I managed to mumble something that didn't entirely embarrass myself. I was still somewhere in orbit from watching Crystal dance. The three of them were gazing at me with questioning looks on their faces. It was a bit disconcerting to tell the truth. What? I asked, smiling, looking at each of them in turn. Well, are you going to come over to our place later? They all said in unison. I was speechless. I could not believe that just by talking to them for a few minutes that Crystal had convinced them to offer themselves. I'm still thinking about it, ladies. I somehow managed to reply. There's a lot more to this than just me having a good time. We know, said Kayla. Crystal gave us the condensed version. Just so you know we all feel really bad for you and would love to um um, give you a hand. I need to go give a table dance, but I'll be back later. This might help you decide. She stood in front of me and gave me a tight hug. Left alone with my thoughts, my mood didn't take long to turn dark again, remembering my wife's infidelity this morning. I couldn't believe what she had done. I wouldn't have believed it was true if I hadn't seen it for myself. 
It was one thing to get drunk on vacation and end up in a compromising position that could be forgiven with enough time. G banging half a dozen garbage men in my own house when I was supposed to be at work was another thing entirely. I suddenly realized that it had to have taken some pre-planning. She had set it up to happen that particular day at that particular time. It was not a sudden thing. This was way more than a fling brought on by a weak moment. The more I thought about it the angrier I became and the more determined I was to find out what was really going on. I wanted to know if this was a one-time thing or something she did on a regular basis. Suddenly it dawned on me why the HL wasn't she at work herself. The thought that entered my mind with that revelation was too disturbing to think about and was quickly pushed to the dark recesses of my mind. I looked at my watch and realized I only had a few hours before I was expected at home. I waved Crystal over to my table and told her I had some things to take care of and was going to take off, that I would think more about her offer and let her know tomorrow. Update 2. I had the beginnings of a plan. My first stop was a large mall on the outskirts of town. One of the stores sold everything a wannabe spy would ever want. I was straightforward with the owner of the shop, telling him I suspected my wife of cheating and that I wanted the best that technology could offer to wire my house for sound and video. I looked at what was available and chose several different styles of cameras for different areas of the house. I purchased enough equipment to give full coverage in every room she could possibly have a tryst in, as well as spares, wiring, transmitters, receivers, and digital recording equipment. I walked out several thousand dollars poorer. I sat in the parking lot of the mall and read the instruction manuals, discovering that I could set the system up and control it all with a computer. The advantage to this was that I could use the computer as a secure server to access and control the entire system from anywhere with an internet connection. Something like that anyway, I'm definitely not a techno geek. Back into the mall I went, in search of a good computer store. I found a small independent outlet a few doors down from the security and surveillance store I was in a short time before. Again, I was forthright with the clerk, telling him what was going on and what I expected the system to do. I told him I was no expert, so to make it simple for someone stupid, which would be me. Luckily, the shop had everything I needed in stock. The clerk was very patient and explained exactly how it all needed to be configured to work the way I wanted. I bought everything I needed, this time making two trips to get it all to the car. This had turned into a very expensive undertaking, but well worth every penny. I pulled everything out of its packaging and managed to stash it all in the trunk before I slowly began to drive home, my plan becoming clearer with every passing mile. I pulled into my street close enough to the same time I do every day to not arouse suspicion. Arriving home, I noticed that my wife's car was not in its usual place in the garage. I walked into the kitchen and found a note on the counter saying that she had gone out with friends for the evening and wouldn't be home until late. I had been wondering when I would get the chance to install the cameras and computer. This was the perfect chance. I brought each item into the house and installed them one at a time just in case she came home early for some reason. I placed three cameras in the game room, covering every square inch of space. One was fixed, the other two were pan, tilt, and zoom capable. All the cameras were full color with sound. The amazing thing was that none of them were much bigger than the buttons on my shirt when installed properly. I made my way from room to room, installing and aiming the cameras as needed. I ended up with a few left over and put one in the office, not having intended to place one there originally. Another of the extras went at the front door, aimed outside. Installing the cameras was the easy part. Hiding the wiring, getting power to them, and placing the transmitters was a bit trickier. After several hours of work the surveillance net, as the story owner had called it, was done. With good instructions and only a bit of cussing, I was able to hide the computer in a basement closet. Wiring the computer to the cameras and into the cable internet was relatively easy. I went back upstairs and fired up my laptop. It was time to test the system. To say I was surprised that everything worked as advertised would be a lie. Amazingly, that is exactly what happened. I was able to access the server and change from camera to camera. I could control the pan, tilt, and zoom for each one. With a little bit of practice I could easily switch from room to room, view to view, split multiple cameras on one screen, and capture images. I was ready for whatever happened, anywhere in the house. A quick glance at my watch told me the slot would be home soon. It would be best if she didn't see any of this. I made a slow circuit of the house looking for each of the cameras. If you didn't know they were there, you would never see them. There were several that I did know were there, and I had to look hard to find the lens. After having a quick dinner and a shower, I headed for bed. I wanted to be asleep when she got home so there was no temptation on her part to try anything frisky. I felt her getting into bed a long time later. 
I glanced over at my alarm clock and realized it would be going off in less than 5 minutes. I noticed that she was freshly showered, though I had not heard the shower running. I rolled out of bed and took care of my morning routine, noting that the shower was indeed dry. This raised even more questions. Was she out ducking around all night? How many guys were there this time? This was way out of control. Had I not had problems at work the previous day I would have never had a clue. I accomplished my normal morning routine as if I were going to work. I guess in a way I was going to work, just not the job she thought I had. I decided over breakfast that my business trip was going to happen today. I would call her this afternoon and let her know that I would be out of town for up to two weeks having a series of meetings at a new client's location. With this decision I headed out for the morning, driving across town to look for a good hotel to spend the time in. I found exactly what I was looking for a few blocks away from the pink peacat. It was an upscale business hotel with underground parking to hide the car and a suite at a reasonable rate. Some suite it was. Two bedrooms with king-sized beds, a sitting room, a personal theater, a fully stocked bar, and a jacuzzi bathtub big enough to have a small party in. After checking out the room I fired up my laptop and signed on to the internet. I checked my house, scanning through the rooms one by one. I found the whore still sleeping in bed. That is exactly what I was beginning to think she was, a whore, for real. As disturbing as the thought was, it fit the scenario. I realized that the internet might be how she is finding all these guys, or them finding her, whichever the case may be. I pulled up Google and soon had a long list of dating sites and sites that listed call girls. It didn't take me long at all to find her. On every one of the large sites I checked, she was right near the top of the listings. Her username was fitting, dot dot dot, and it was the same on all the sites I found. I was mildly surprised by the graphic pictures she had posted on her profile. Her face was clear in most of them. She wasn't trying to be discreet at all. I was really beginning to feel like an idiot. How had I not noticed her behavior earlier? Here she was splashed all over the web. There were dozens of pictures of her with different groups of guys. It seemed like she was begging to be caught, or maybe she didn't care if she was. Her profiles were fitting well. I had proof now. She was in fact a W whore, with every awful connotation of the word possible. I figured these profiles would be a good thing for my divorce lawyer to see when I was ready, so I printed out each one along with the pictures she had posted. What I wouldn't give to have access to these sites so I could get her emails too, I thought to myself. I checked the house again and caught her getting out of the shower. For a dirty whore, she sure had one HL of a body. She was 5 feet 6, 120 pounds, 36 degrees Celsius. She had a trim stomach. I watched as she applied her makeup and went into the bedroom to get dressed. I switched cameras and found three guys at the front door waiting for her to answer. When she did their eyes about popped out of their heads, and I couldn't blame them. I followed them through the house to the game room. They sat and talked for a few minutes before one of the guys leaned forward and placed an envelope on the coffee table. I guess this was her donation. I saw her glance at the envelope and smile as she got up and went over to the stereo. She put a CD in and started dancing to the music. She could have been a stripper but was nowhere near the caliber of Crystal. She was dancing around the room, slowly working her way closer and closer to her three customers. After that I could not believe what I was seeing. I had seen her the day before with the six guys, but with what had happened that morning with the pictures of our wedding, and at work, it hadn't quite registered. Now, with my mind clear, this was just surreal. Here was my wife, who I thought had been faithful since our counseling, being filled in all three holes by complete strangers. Not only that, but being paid to do it. I thought I was a good judge of people, especially her. It was mind-boggling to see how wrong I was. After a few minutes the guys got dressed and left the room. She laid there for a while longer before getting up and retrieving the envelope from the coffee table. I zoomed in with one of the cameras as she opened it and counted the bills inside. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. She had just been paid $1,000 for giving up her body. After the initial shock, the thought that crossed my mind was where was all this money going? I followed her through the house as she went to the master bathroom, laid the envelope on the counter, undressed, and took a long shower. After the shower she put on a bathrobe, got the money, and made her way to the office. I watched as she pulled back a corner of the carpet and opened a safe that was in the floor. I was feeling more like an idiot all the time. I didn't even know it was there. I got lucky placing an extra camera in the office, luckier still that I had aimed it in such a way that I could see the combination to the safe. I continued to watch as she went to her computer and logged on to each of the dating and escort sites where she was a member. I noticed several that I hadn't found earlier and made a note to go take a look later. Once again, I got lucky and saw what her password was. She wasn't being very smart, they were all the same. 
Looking at my watch, I noticed it was almost noon. More time had passed than I realized. I decided now was as good a time as any to go on my business trip. I picked up my cell phone and called home, watching as an annoyed look cross her face as she saw the caller ID and hearing her say SHT, it's the as whole. Now I was even more angry. The slimy slot was going to pay. I made the conversation short and sweet, telling her I had to fly out of town later this afternoon for a trip. She didn't even seem phased. Her voice didn't change, but I could see the smile on her face. She told me she was going shopping that afternoon with some girlfriends and not to expect her home when I came to pack for my trip. Girlfriends my ass. She probably had another group of guys to go duck. It would probably be a good idea if I calmed down before I went home, just in case she was still there. If I was still this angry, I don't know if I could restrain myself from kicking her worthless whoring as out right then and there. Update 3. I went over to the PCAT and went to the same table I sat at yesterday. In a matter of minutes Crystal, Brittany, and Kayla were sitting with me asking how things were going. I told them about the cameras and computer setup and what I had seen this morning. It was good to get it off my chest and even better, if not a bit amusing, to see their anger flare as I related her escapade this morning. Kayla was the first to speak up when I was done. So, when do we get to duck your brains out? I laughed at her bluntness and replied, I've been thinking about it a lot girls, and I think it would be a really bad idea to do anything before I'm officially separated. They seem to take this in stride, but with obvious disappointment. I explained to them that no matter how I thought about it, if I were to go have fun with them right now it would make me the same as the slot, and that I was better than that. They seemed to accept this explanation, and then informed me that if made them with too long they would duck me so hard I wouldn't be able to move for a week. I told them not to be so sure, it might be them not being able to move. Kayla and Brittany got up to go dance, leaving me with Crystal, not that I was complaining. We sat there for a couple of hours chatting about anything and everything that came to mind. I found out she was a junior at a local university with a 4.0 GPA, majoring in criminal justice. She was a very bright young lady, well-read, well-spoken, and an absolute delight to engage in conversation. She was very down-to-earth and knew enough about a variety of subjects to carry on an intelligent conversation. Eventually, the manager came over and told her it was time to get back to work. It was also time for me to head to the house. I could no longer think of it as home and get my things. When I got to the house the slot was gone, so I hurried upstairs and packed what I normally would for a business trip. I never wanted to come back here to live, but couldn't take everything I would like just yet. After I carried the suitcases out to the car I went into the office, pulled back the carpet, and opened the safe. I was completely stunned at what I found. The safe was about 2 feet in diameter, and 3 feet deep. Inside were stacks and stacks of bills. I pulled out a few and saw they were all hundreds, bound in $10,000 bundles. A quick count told me there was well over 3 quarters of a million dollars here. My mind was completely blank, my body numb, my world spinning out of control. I could not believe that I never suspected a thing. I had to stop thinking about the sheer numbers or I would drive myself nuts. I drove away from the house in a daze, on autopilot as I made my way across town to the hotel. A sudden thought occurred to me that caused a chill to envelop my entire body, nearly causing me to black out in sheer panic. I realized that I had duck at her during all this. She had been doing this for what looked like a long time. I had only found out yesterday. God only knows how many times I had duck at her while she was letting other men do the same without protection. I quickly pulled over to the side of the road, opened the door, and lost my lunch. After I had recovered, I knew exactly what I needed to do next. It took a few minutes for my head to clear well enough to figure out where I was and where the nearest hospital was located. I'm surprised I didn't get any speeding tickets on my way there. I ran into the hospital and to the clinic, nearly out of breath when I got to the counter. I pleaded with the receptionist behind the desk to fit me in. It was very important. She could clearly see my anxiety and was sympathetic, telling me she would do her best. I sat in the waiting room for what seemed like hours, but was in reality only 30 minutes or so. After being called to the back I explained to the doctor what had happened, almost retching again as I recounted the story. He seemed genuinely concerned about my predicament and recommended that a complete series of tests be done immediately. I agreed, of course, and spent the rest of my visit being poked, prodded, scraped, and inspected. The doctor informed me that my results should be back within two weeks and that he would call me when they were in. I gave him my cell phone number, not wanting this call to go anywhere else, especially the house. I was still in a daze after the doctor's visit and couldn't think clearly enough to do anything but go to the hotel. I was angry, confused, hurt, and yes, scared too. I vaguely remember getting to my room and opening a fifth of bourbon from the bar. 
I woke the next morning with the worst hangover of my life. Seeing the empty bottle beside my bed, I was surprised I was still alive. The evening came back to me in bits and pieces as I slowly woke up. I remember sitting there, taking long pulls from the bottle, as I thought about what had happened to my life. I cried, angry at that ducking bish for putting me in this position. I wept, thinking about what might happen if she had passed anything on to me. I became enraged thinking about all of this. The thoughts in my head were not pretty. I have never been a violent person, but the ideas I had that night were violent indeed. I shrugged off the visions of stringing the dot up in the garage and skinning her alive. That would be too nice. I was going to make her suffer in ways she could never imagine, all without laying a hand on her in anger. Originally, I had only wanted enough evidence to make sure she got next to nothing in a divorce. Now I wanted not only that, but for her to suffer a thousand times worse than I was suffering now. Update 4. I knew exactly what my leverage would be. Two things were important to her that I knew about. Her family and her money. I would take both away from her. Her parents were the best people I had ever met. They would give a person anything they could if it would help and never ask for a thing in return. Her brothers and sisters were the same as her parents. Where the disgusting bish I married went bad, I have no idea. Her family was also extremely conservative, somewhere to the right of Jesse Helms. There was many a spirited family discussion where their views were made clear. In their view, adultery should be punishable by hanging in the town square. Prostitution should be punishable by public disembowelment, followed by hanging. Imagine their surprise when they found out their daughter was not only an adulteress, but a W whore too. As for the money, that was even easier. I knew where it was. I would simply take it when she was out. What was she going to do? Call the cops. After I took a shower and ate breakfast, I was feeling much better. My plans for revenge were coming together and replacing the sorrow I had been feeling the night before. I left the hotel feeling a little better about my situation now that I had some idea of what to do. I returned to the computer store and purchased a top-of-the-line photo printer and several packages of photo paper before I went over to the strip club again. I sat with Crystal and had a very long sincere conversation with her about everything that had happened the day before. She was very pleased that I had visited a doctor and been tested for everything under the sun. She was even more pleased when I told her I would not put her at risk by doing anything with her until I was sure I had a clean bill of health. The more she and I talked, the closer we became. We were like kids on the first few dates, spilling everything that was on our minds. We had no reason to hold anything back. She told me about her checkered past, some of it wasn't pretty. I told her everything about mine. I don't know why or how, we just seemed to connect and be able to trust each other on a very deep level. Returning to the hotel, I set up the new printer and worked my way through all of the pictures I had taken and captured from the cameras. I enhanced each one, making sure there was a clear shot of the slot face. I printed out the best ones, making multiple copies of each. I also visited the personal sites I had missed before and printed out each of her profiles and pictures. While on the web, I logged onto each of the sites and printed off all of the emails she had saved. I reviewed the tapes from the night before and saw she had entertained two more groups of guys. The first group with four guys, the other with seven. I captured all the relevant images and printed those out as well, struggling to keep my anger in check. I certainly had enough evidence to put my plan into motion anytime I wanted, but I wanted more. I wanted to be sure that there was no question of what she was. I needed to make sure there was no way she could extricate herself from what she had done. I not only wanted to hurt her, I wanted to ducking destroy her. I went back to the PCAT, again sitting with Crystal and talking for a long time. I told her what I was planning and she loved my ideas, enhancing a few of them throughout our conversation. She was a devious little brat, no question about that. She suggested that when I was ready to present my evidence, that I also mail a copy of everything I had to the district attorney's office. Being a criminal justice major, she was sure the authorities would do something, but she wasn't sure about the evidentiary value of the pictures and the personal profiles from the web. At the very least, there would be some kind of investigation, one more knife to thrust in and twist. Crystal returned to the hotel with me after work, surprised at the opulence of the suite. She was like a kid in a candy store as she checked out the rooms, and her eyes got huge when she saw the bathtub. I told her to go ahead and use it if she wanted. She was filling the tub with water before I finished speaking. I admit that I was having a hard time controlling myself with this beautiful girl in front of me. I had come to care for her and did not want to hurt her in any way, especially by passing on something I may have caught from the slot. I was leave the room. We talked through the evening, revealing even more of ourselves to each other. She told me her dreams, wants, needs, desires, goals, and passions. I shared all I was with her. I didn't know why we were doing this or have any idea where this might lead. 
I was very much enjoying the closeness, the pure intimacy, which I had never shared with another person. She asked to see the setup on my computer that I had told her about. I logged into the house server and started showing her the different cameras. I was a little nervous that the slot might be entertaining again. I was relieved when I switched to the game room and found it empty. I switched through the rest of the cameras one by one, the last being the main bedroom. I was stunned at what was on the screen. Crystal gasped and hugged me tight when the scene became clear. There was the W whore on the bed, my bed, with some guys. It appeared that they were just finishing their session. Once again, we watched as she opened the envelope that was on the nightstand and counted out $7,500. I was able to maintain my composure for a while anyway. I rewound the recording, captured images, and printed them out with Crystal holding me the entire time. I checked back through the tape and found yet another session earlier in the afternoon, not long after I had been to the house. I captured and printed the images from this humiliation as well. Update 5. I finally let go and broke down. I couldn't help it, I couldn't hold it in any longer. Crystal led me to the bed and lay down beside me, holding me in her arms and whispering comforting words softly in my ear. I eventually drifted off to sleep completely and totally emotionally drained. When I awoke the next morning, Crystal was still there holding me. I can't begin to describe how good that felt. After waking up enough to be somewhat coherent, I reminded her that she was late for work. She told me she had called in for the day. She said I needed someone here with me, and I didn't argue. We had a very serious talk that morning during breakfast. Crystal was genuinely worried about my mental well-being. We agreed that it was time to take care of this. If I didn't do it now it would destroy me. I couldn't handle letting this go on any longer. It was time for it to stop. There were a few more details to take care of, and then it would be over. I'll admit that what I did next was probably illegal as HL. Ask me if I care. I fired up the computer, printed out a power of attorney, and forged the slot's signature, giving me sole power over all our joint holdings. I made a quick visit to my longtime lawyer and had everything we held jointly placed in my name only, the house, cars, vacation cabin, property, and brokerage accounts. Surprisingly, this was a relatively quick and painless thing to do. I also visited the bank and removed her name from all of our accounts. I left one account for her, with a $1 balance, laughing silently to myself during the entire process. While I was at the bank, I signed the necessary paperwork to have all of our credit cards cancelled in two days and had a new one issued to me under a completely new account. Finally, I visited my real estate broker and placed the house on the market for immediate sale. I could never live there again. With these details taken care of it was time to take advantage of overnight delivery. I returned to the hotel after a quick stop at an office supply warehouse. Crystal helped me collate the pictures, profiles, and emails and place them in envelopes. I printed out address labels for her parents, two brothers, three sisters, the district attorney, the chief of police, her church, two local newspapers, and the half dozen of her friends I had addresses for. We left the hotel and stopped at the first express mail store we saw and sent the envelopes off. I was so anxious I was bouncing off the walls. I had accepted she was a filthy W whore. I was in the process of getting her out of my life for good. But it still felt strange to be doing this to someone I had once cared for. As I said earlier, I have never been a violent person. Well, I have never been a vindictive person either. I was not used to doing something like this. I couldn't shut all of my emotions off, all at once. Crystal could tell I was shocked at what I was doing and reminded me, in great detail, why I needed to do it. There was one last item to take care of. We returned to the hotel and checked the cameras at the house, finding it empty. I rewound and saw that the slot had left about an hour before, dressed to the nines. I figured she would be selling her body for a few hours, more than enough time for me to do what needed to be done. I told Crystal to wait for me here, that I would be back in an hour or so. She was not happy to let me go alone, she wanted to be there for moral support if I needed it. I assured her I would be fine and left after a tight hug and gentle kiss. I raced across town to the house, letting myself in through the garage. I quickly went to the office and opened the safe, finding it even fuller than it was a couple of days ago. I emptied the safe into a large duffel bag and raced back to the hotel. We spread the money on one of the beds and counted, then recounted, and counted again to make sure. The final tally was just short of a million dollars. We were both completely speechless as we sat there staring at the stacks of bills. Later that night was most amusing. We watched as the slot came home, looking rather well duck ed, and went to place her money in the safe. I had never heard anyone scream that loud, nor had I ever heard such obscenity spewed. I had to laugh as she spent the night pacing the house cussing like a sailor. If that was amusing, what happened the next morning was hysterical. Her parents were the first to call her. I could not hear their side of the conversation. 
but I could hear the slot trying to deny everything in a shaking voice. She ended up slamming the phone down, curling up in a ball in the middle of the floor and bawling her eyes out. I almost felt sorry for her. Over the next few hours, the phone rang several more times. Each time it was someone who had received one of the packages I sent, or so I gathered from the W horse side of the conversation. Each time she tried to deny everything, only to hang up on whomever it was she was talking with and go back to crying. I suddenly realized that I had forgotten to send copies to her also. I quickly printed out everything I had, placed it in an envelope, and called a courier service. I watched a half hour later as she opened the envelope. Her face drained of all color as she slumped to the floor, stunned and shaken. I hoped she was feeling at least 10% of what I had felt over the last few days. Epilogue The days, weeks, and months flew by after exposing her for what she was. I was in contact with her siblings, friends, and parents. Each of them offered their sympathies for what had happened and assured me their doors would always be open. Nobody knew that I was the one who had exposed her, and it didn't really matter anyway. I finally got a call from the doctor's office, giving me the good news and the bad. I didn't have anything terminal or anything that couldn't be cured. I took a battery of medications for a while, finally getting a clean bill of health. I still get tested for those things that don't show up right away and will continue to do so for a very long time. The slot was arrested and charged with prostitution and money laundering. She didn't have any funds to mount a defense and was easily convicted. She was sentenced to a very long prison term because of the flagrancy of her actions and the fact that she not only didn't deny anything, but was defensive about her extracurricular activities. The authorities are still wondering what happened to the money she had to have made. I only saw her once since the day I sent the envelopes out, and that was in court for our divorce. She did not contest anything, and the judge did not give her anything. The house sold a few months later. I hired movers to go in and retrieve my personal belongings. I could not even think about setting foot in that place again. Everything I didn't want was thrown away at the landfill. I thought about donating it to charity, but didn't want to subject anyone to the filth it was associated with. With the money I took from the slot and from the sale of the house, I had a very nice nest egg. I bought a very nice, very large new house in a different neighborhood. I paid off the student loans for Crystal, Brittany, and Kayla without them knowing and set up a fund to pay for their tuition and books through the rest of their schooling. Somehow, through all of this, Crystal and I fell deeply in love. She moved into my new house a few months after this ordeal was over and has been here ever since turning it into a true home. We will be getting married in a few months and could not be happier. It does not worry me that she is a self-professed slot. She is my slot. Kayla and Brittany visit on occasion, sometimes to just chat, and other times for more intimate undertakings. The end. Thank you for reading the story. We look forward to sharing more powerful stories with you in the future. We encourage you to subscribe to our channel and stay connected with our community. Don't forget to subscribe. Take care yourself and see you soon.